Hi, everyone, and welcome. We will be getting started just in a few minutes. We're just waiting for people to file in and join us. Please feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen as we wait for more people to join us. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. We're just waiting for a few more people to join us. Um, please feel free to use the Q&A function in the meantime if you have any questions. Thanks for your patience. Hello and welcome to Breakthrough or Breakdown. Should the FDA have approved the new Alzheimer's drug, a Hastings Center conversation? We are pleased to be joined by doctors Aaron Kesselheim, Jason Karlowish, and Mildred Solomon. While audience members will not be audible or visible during the webinar, we do hope for strong audience participation. So please do ask questions and type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We aren't using the chat function, just the Q&A one. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Hastings Center website later today. It's the 11th webinar the Hastings Center has sponsored since 2020, all on emerging ethical issues in health and health research. You can locate all of these on the Hastings Center website, thehastingscenter.org. Now I would like to introduce Mildred Solomon, president of the Hastings Center, who will be leading us in this discussion. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Danny. There are 600 of you uh, participating in this event, and uh, we thank you for joining us. A couple of weeks ago, the Food and Drug Administration made a decision to approve a new Alzheimer's drug, aducanumab, also known by its brand name, Aduhelm. The FDA chose not to approve Aduhelm under their usual pathway because they acknowledged that the trials had not provided strong enough evidence of clinical benefit. But they did give it approval under their accelerated approval pathway. This is a special pathway that enables the FDA to approve drugs which um, show impact on a surrogate endpoint or a biomarker. In this case, the biomarker was the prevalence of amyloid plaque in the brain, which has been thought to be, though not proven to be, associated with cognitive impairment. Biomarkers are used rather than clinical improvements in disease or medical condition because such trials usually would have to run longer to detect a clinical benefit. The FDA asserted that it wasn't certain, but that it was reasonably likely that reductions in amyloid plaque could slow the progression of cognitive impairment, and therefore, Adjuhelm might demonstrate clinical benefit in future trials. Adjuhelm is the first drug approved for cognitive impairment in the last 18 years. The Alzheimer's Association has hailed it as, quote, a new era in Alzheimer's treatment and research. A new era, they see it as a new age, and they believe it's going to lead to a string of powerful new tools in the fight against the condition. On the other hand, numerous scientists, clinicians, bioethicists, and policymakers have serious concerns about the drug's efficacy, its side effects, and the possible negative social, scientific, and financial consequences of its approval. Perhaps most important is that in November 2020, the FDA's own advisory committee unanimously arrived at the conclusion that the clinical trials provided no convincing evidence of efficacy. Now, such advisory committee findings are most often determinative, but the FDA went ahead with approval anyway, and in response, three committee members, one of whom is with us today, 
resigned in protest. Although the key dispute has been over the question of efficacy, the expected annual price tag, which has been set by Biogen, the drug maker, has added fuel to this fiery protest. Biogen has set an annual price tag of about $56,000, representing an annual cost to Medicare of anywhere between 29 and $100 billion, depending on the number of patients who take it. A car, and in addition, there's gonna be costs for patients for co-pays and for imaging studies that are required to screen for both eligibility and side effects. It's been pointed out that at this price, the nation would be paying more for this questionably effective drug than the entire budget for NASA, our National Space Exploration Program. In preparing this event, the Hastings Center sought, as we always do, to include people known to have contrasting views. We invited the FDA and the Alzheimer's Association to send a representative to join our panel. Both organizations declined our invitation. We are, however, honored to have two outstanding experts here with us today. Aaron Kesselheim is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and in the Division of Pharmacoepidemiology and Pharmacoeconomics in Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. He is both a physician and a lawyer, and he is a well um, world renowned expert in ethics and health policy related to drug development. Dr. Kesselheim was one of the three members of the FDA advisory committee who resigned over the FDA's decision. Dr. Jason Karlowish is a Hastings fellow. He is a professor of medicine and a neurologist at the University of Pennsylvania's Perlman School of Medicine, where he co-directs the Penn Memory Center. Dr. Karlowish is an expert in the care of people with Alzheimer's disease, and he's recently published a highly praised book the Problem of Alzheimer's, How Science, Culture, and Politics Turned a Rare Disease into a Crisis and What We Can Do About It. Welcome to you both. I'm gonna start with you, Dr. Kesselheim, because first I want our audience to know as much as possible about the clinical trials themselves, that, uh, about the advisory committee findings and why you felt it was important to resign. And then I'm gonna to turn to you, Dr. Carla Wish, to help patients and family members in our audience make sense of their personal options. I think our audience will want your advice. Is this a drug that they should ask for? And then we're going to open it up to those of you in the audience. Um, Danny is gonna be collecting your questions. You can write your questions into the Q&A function at any time and she'll be going through those. We're not using the chat function, so make sure you use the Q&A. So let's begin. Erin, my understanding is that Biogen ran two different clinical trials. Would you describe the trials and what they found? Uh, sure, uh, Dr. Solomon. Thank you for inviting me to this, uh, to this panel and, and, uh, and I'm, I'm excited for the conversation over the next hour. Um, so the, yeah, the, the essential controversy here um, relating to the two pivotal trials that Biogen organized to test the uh, efficacy of aducanumab. Um, and I want to say first off that, you know, that Biogen should be commended for organizing two large uh, trials testing the clinical effects of the drug. The, you know, the, when, we, when FDA approves drugs, it approves drugs on the basis of idea that there is substantial evidence of effectiveness um, from adequate and well-controlled trials. And, and to try to meet that standard, um, Biogen organized two, uh, two trials basically with the same design. Um, and uh, these trials were intended to test the progression of, um, the progression of, of the clinical symptoms that uh, patients with early Alzheimer's disease and uh, evidence of uh, amyloid plaques on, uh, on, on PET imaging had um, over the course of a number of months uh, of their, um, of their getting after, meanwhile, getting, getting treatment with, uh, with aducanumab at, at two different dosing levels and, at a, and with a placebo. Um, so the uh, Biogen organized these two different trials um, and uh, the controversy arose uh, because Biogen had a, a predetermined stopping rule for these trials, a, a, a rule where um, the trials would be analyzed together and determine whether or not it appeared that the drug was futile 
uh, and was not providing any benefit. And what happened was, was that when um, Biogen's Data Safety Monitoring Board evaluated the, um, the trials together for futility, uh, it showed that there was no evidence, that, no hope that the drug would um, would show uh, benefit. And so um, Biogen uh, publicly announced that it was stopping the trials um, for futility. And then um, the controversy arose in, in, uh, because um, Biogen then, um, as, a, as a little bit more data um, rolled in from the wrapping up of the trials, Biogen then looked back at the trials individually and found that in one of the trials, in one of the arms, um, it appeared as if there was a statistically significant um, reduction in the um, progress of patients in their um, in their um, in Alzheimer's disease course in in that in that trial. As measured by a slowing of their cognitive decline, the pace of cognitive decline. Measured by a very slight slowing in the pace of their cognitive decline. So the the measurement that they used to determine the cognitive decline was a uh, a clinical measurement called the um, CDRSB or CDR sum of boxes, which is a, um, a widely used scale uh, in the field uh, um, that measures cognitive decline on a on a scale of of one of zero to eighteen um, points. And what they found was in the high dose arm of one of the two trials um, that patients. Um, decline in their CDR sum of boxes um, slowed by, by about uh, 20% or um, 0.39 um, points on this, uh, on this CDR sum of boxes scale over the course of 18 months of therapy. Well, 20% reduction sounds like it's not tiny. Well, 20% reduction is not, not tiny, but the actual reduction, the sort of absolute reduction was only 0.39 uh, on the scale, which was uh, almost imperceptible to the patients and the family members themselves, but was observable based on the, um, based on the, the you know, the uh, application of the sum of boxes scale. And they were, so the FDA in its own public statements that I've read has said that they agreed with the advisory committee that this wasn't strong enough proof of efficacy, even this, even in this small subgroup. Where, where this change was seen? Well, right? actually, um, so, what, so the FDA, so when we met as an advisory committee back in November, the FDA stated flat out that any um, statistically significant change in CDR sum of boxes, they would consider to be um, clinically meaningful. They didn't care how small the sum of boxes change was. The controversy at the advisory committee was the fact that um, what happened was is that after Biogen uh, identified this, um, this statistically significant change in the high dose arm of one of the two trials, Biogen and the FDA um, worked together to reanalyze the, the two different uh, studies and try to understand why the one study failed and was wrong and why the other study that showed the positive effect was right. And then what they did was they presented that information to the advisory committee and, and asked the advisory committee if we thought that, um, that, the, that the totality of the evidence that was presented showed that it looked like there was a clinical benefit for this drug. And our response um, as an advisory committee, which was near unanimous, was that it did not appear that there was convincing evidence. In fact, there was one um, you know, one statistically significant uh, um, arm of one trial and one negative trial. And um, both of those together suggested that we don't really know if this drug works and the right thing to do would be to study it in a, uh, in, you know, further and to try to provide a clearer answer as to whether or not this drug actually affects cognitive function because we didn't think that it, we didn't think that the evidence to that point was uh, was was convincing that it did that because you had the one positive and the one negative trial, and um, it, you know and and in addition to that, of course, there were a whole bunch of side effects that were associated with the drug during the trials, and for that reason, we weren't as an advisory committee, um, we were not convinced by the you know that the that the drug showed a, a clear uh, effectiveness. And in a public statement, I think I I think it was in the New York Times. Um, the Center for Drug Evaluation Research said that the F we, we recommended approval um, not because of clinical benefit, but under the accelerated pathway because we saw a reduction in, a, in the biomarker, in a reduction in amyloid plaques. So they seem to have agreed with you that there wasn't 
enough evidence about efficacy? Well, so at the at the advisory committee meeting itself, it seemed pretty clear that the FDA and Biogen were both pushing for uh, to to you know that that they did think that there was uh, evidence of clinical benefit. And um, so what happened was was that after the advisory committee voted um, uh, nearly unanimously that there wasn't, um, the FDA then came back and approved the drug in June on the basis of its effect on visible amyloid plaques. And in fact, the drug does appear to uh, reduce visible amyloid plaques um, pretty clearly. And I, I think the issue is, is that it's not really clear what that means, that there is a lot of uncertainty in the field about whether changing amyloid plaques, even in patients with early Alzheimer's disease, is meaningful in altering the course of a disease. But they didn't actually, I mean, when, when we talked about that at the advisory committee, they explicitly excluded discussion of amyloid plaque as a surrogate for clinical effect. They said, look, we're not looking at the amyloid plaque, we're focusing on the actual clinical benefit. And so what it appeared was that after the advisory committee uh, voted against it, the FDA switched course on its, on its comments and instead approved the drug on the basis that it changes amyloid plaque and you know isn't you, you know is not making any claims about whether or not it clearly changes um, cognitive function, but are saying we think that the fact that it changes amyloid plaques means that it's reasonably likely to affect amyloid to affect your your um, to affect your cognitive function. But you know as we pointed out in these trials, um, you know that that followed patients for eighteen months. Um, that have already been run, you've got one trial that shows that it doesn't actually do that. And one trial that shows that it, it does do that to a, to a very small, to a very small degree. So I don't know on what basis the FDA is making this claim that this drug will have a reasonable likelihood that it will affect cognitive function, because we already have two trials actually testing the drug on its cognitive function. And, and everyone seemed to agree at the advisory committee that it wasn't, it wasn't a very convincing effect. So at the bottom line, what do you, what were the main reason or reasons that you decided to resign? Um, well, I decided to resign because I felt like uh, as an advisory committee member that I was uh, I was very concerned about the process and the um, the way that the advisory committee was set up. Um, you know, usually advisory committees are set up where the, you know, the FDA presents one side, one, one point of view and the co company presents a different point of view and you can see where the controversy was. In this case, the advisory committee was set up where it seemed like the FDA and the company were in full agreement about what should happen. And they were looking to the advisory committee to kind of give it a, um, you know, sort of a validation. And it wasn't really clear what the controversy was. And then when, we had presented our view that where there wasn't convincing evidence that this drug works to then, you know, after that switch and, and uh, switched perspectives and switched the premise on which they were evaluating the drug and then approve the drug on a totally different premise that they presented to the advisory committee made me concerned that they weren't using the advisory committees as they should, as truly, you know, sort of independent expert views on, on a, um, on an important uh, on an important issue. Now, of course, you know the FDA doesn't have to um, uh, you know agree with the advisory committee or follow the advisory committee's recommendations, but they should at least you know sort of respect the process enough to um, you know make sure that the advisory committee is is providing um, important insight that is then that where there is then a process for implementing that insight um, and. Um, if there is a, a, a difference of opinion that the FDA decides to go against that insight, then, you know, some clear explanation as to why they did that or, you know, some, so I, I felt like, so I, had, I felt like I, re, I resigned to try to bring attention to um, what I thought was, um, you know, the way that the FDA was getting away from, you know, using advisory committees to the extent that they are supposed to be used in order to provide support and trust for um, you know, the FDA is making independent decisions about about the drugs that they're reviewing. So um, that was so. I, I think that that night I brought. I think I you know I, I resigned not only to bring attention to what I thought was a extremely problematic approval, uh, but also to to bring attention to the process leading to that approval, which I also thought was very problematic. Thank you, um, Dr. Carlowish. Um, I, I'm, I wanna focus on your advice for patients and also for clinicians who may be inundated with requests for this drug. But before I do, I wanna give you a chance to respond to the, to, to the issues 
that um, Aaron and I have been talking about. Um, you know, what the FDA's ruling was. Is there anything you want to underscore or um, highlight um, in terms of this process? Sure, yeah. And again, thank you, uh, Mildred, for organizing this gathering. And I greetings everyone from uh, North Creek, New York, where I'm in a cabin uh, on a bit of a holiday. Hence, thank uh, you for doing it during your vacation. Thanks. Hence, hence uh, unlike Dr. Kesselheim, I'm a bit undre underdressed, if you will, uh, <laughs> compared to... Uh, my colleague, but greetings from uh, from the Adirondacks. Um, I uh, on the morning of uh, June seventh, um, uh, if you had asked me, is um, amyloid beta amyloid an adequate surrogate for the treatment of persons with mild cognitive impairment or mild stage dementia due to Alzheimer's disease? I would have said that that's a provocative hypothesis that uh, is a, the source of urgent study and 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 uh, needs more study. Uh, but by the evening of June 7th, it had become clinical practice. And it, it became clinical practice because by fiat, essentially, a divided uh, FDA uh, uh, transformed that uh, uh, into clinical practice, namely that you can use a PET beta amyloid measure together with aducanumab to treat a patient. Uh, Aaron's nicely outlined the events. I'll just reiterate that um, many in the field share the same shock that I felt of the transformation of the amyloid hypothesis into clinical practice by a regulatory fiat from a divided FDA. We would only learn in the weeks to follow that actually FDA was divided. And number two, uh, we were very disturbed. And I say we, you know, colleagues, et cetera, I'll speak now though for myself, that um, the November hearing was about standard approval, uh, safe and effective uh, was the questionnaire and his colleagues had to answer. Um, there had been no discussion of accelerated approval. As Aaron points out, it was actually summarily rejected by Billy Dunn um, as, the, as a topic of, of interest. Um, and, uh, and yet, of course, that was the regulatory basis was accelerated approval uh, with no discussion in an advisory board and really no discussion in the field. Uh, the field was very keen uh, that we want to see, we still wanna see um, a surrogate approach to treating this disease, much like hypertension, uh, uh, diabetes, uh, other chronic progressive diseases that unfold relentlessly and slowly over time. But we know, we knew, we still know that to do that, we need really good initial studies that validate a surrogate. And um, the studies that uh, Biogen conducted simply didn't give us the strength of evidence to make that claim, like past studies, say, with the uh, uh, a drug that came to be known as Lipitor really established the cholesterol hypothesis. And so the field now is divided and uh, disappointed and we find ourselves now in this very difficult situation. So your question to me was, uh, what will I tell my patients? Now I'm on record as saying I won't prescribe it. I wrote that uh, and published that in Stat News a week or two before the decision. My uh, message was to FDA. They chose not to listen to me. <laughs> um, yes. and, and, so, and so now it's in clinical practice. And so let me be uh, frank and candid. I will prescribe it, but I'm a reluctant prescriber. And why will I do that? Well, you know, um, this is a disease that relentlessly chips away at a person's self-determination and autonomy. Um, that's why it's a disease, I think, meaning that's the suffering it causes. And as a practitioner who focuses on the care of persons with Alzheimer's disease and other disorders that cause dementia, I have a real commitment to doing everything I can to preserve, protect, and defend their autonomy. Um, and so um, now that the FDA, I have to respect the system as much as I now am worried about the system, has made this drug available. Um, if after educating a patient and their family, especially the dyad at least, of the drug's uncertainties of benefit, not just uncertainties of benefit, the risks, uh, additional considerations, et cetera. If someone chooses to take it, I will write a prescription, but I am a reluctant prescriber. So say more about the risks and the side effects and what your argument would be against prescribing it. Well, you know, the, it, the risks to me, the risks to, you know, look, you know, I'm an internist and, uh, uh, you know, I'm used to risky drugs. Um, uh, uh, when I used to practice general internal medicine, um, but risky drugs are of course balanced against benefits. And to me, the starter concern I have here is that this is a drug that should not be available because I write a prescription for it, but it should be available because I hand someone an informed consent form to consider being in a clinical trial for it. And I, I think the drug needs 
initial study to firmly establish it because the benefit is uncertain. I'm in equipoise as to whether this drug is effective. And I would be very enthusiastic about having someone in a clinical trial to study it, but mm -hmm. I'm unenthusiastic about writing a prescription to give it to someone in what amounts to an end of one clinical trial. Um, but again, you know, if someone says, well, I'll take that uncertain benefit because at least some folks thought it was worth approval. It got FDA imprimatur, right, Dr. Carlos? It does, yes. Um, but then they need to know about those risks of microhemorrhages and microedema, which can be detected by MRI, I won't detail it. I'm not trying to be light about it, but I think in a well done, well monitored prescribing, you know, the, the, those risks can be detected before they become devastating. I think there's concern about wide prescribing uh, given, you know, folks in clinical trials are generally quite healthy. They're of course well monitored, et cetera. But, you know, again, I can tolerate a risky drug if I know it's got some benefit, but this one, I don't know if that's been established. I, I know that that has not been established. And indeed to wrap up, the FDA knows it's not been established because they want a confirmatory trial conducted um, as part of their approval. And Biogen has nine years with which to get those data. Isn't that an awfully long time? They're allowing them to wait until 2030 to report the results of another trial at nine years of experience with this, you know, with the side effects and all that. Is that was that an is that a usual time time length? I'll let Aaron weigh in on the, the sort of regulatory conditions around accelerated approvals, validation studies. I will say just as a clinician, uh, that's an awfully long time. But I, Aaron, you may have thoughts about what the regs say about how much time you've got to get the data back once you're out there on accelerated approval. Well, I think, uh, unfortunately, the, the regs don't say anything. And that, I think, is part of the problem here, is that I wish the regs did actually say something about how long, if you do approve something by accelerated approval, how long we should expect um, a follow-up clinical trial to be. I think, first of all, if you approve something on accelerated approval, you should go into the process with the um, confirmatory trial already organized and already underway at the time the drug is approved, meaning you were anticipating accelerated approval you know, earlier in the process. And that way you can get the trial started and underway so that you can have results earlier so that you can actually have more of a chance of recruiting patients into it because it's, it's hard to recruit patients into a placebo controlled trial on the one hand, when they could just go next yeah. door and get the drug in usual clinical practice. And so um, these I think are all changes that could, we could make at a policy level to the accelerator approval pathway to try to ensure that the pathway you know, is still available for drugs to which it's reasonably applied, but still you know, that we, we can expect benefit uh, results in, in, a, in a reasonable time frame. I think, unfortunately, with past experience with accelerated approval drugs, um, a lot of, so, you know, a lot of those drugs take many years before there are confirmatory trials. Those confirmatory trials are oftentimes still subpar in the way that they're organized. And then in some cases, the FDA doesn't uh, act on drugs with negative confirmatory trials to take either the drug or the indication off the market. Uh, and that's a problem. I, I, there's one other thing I am telling my patients and their family members one-on-one um, -on -one as well as in our Pet Memory Center communications on the uh, Atacanumab um, is the story, the story that we're talking about now. And you said, well, you know, why tell them that story? What, what's the point of it? That's not, you know, I think though that people need to know where the process that put a drug in front of them. Um, and in the case of this drug, the process as Aaron is nicely detailed and uh, elsewhere, and I won't repeat it, uh, raises real concerns about um, how this drug now is before you, patient, um, to be taken. And I think people need to think about that when they reflect on whether they want to take the drug. Um, because I think, you know, Aaron used a very important word, um, which is trust. I think we have to have trust in uh, the FDA that their decisions are decisions we can live with, that the system worked. I kind of think of it like a court, you know, you may not like the outcome, but you can live with it because everyone got treated fairly by the rules or correctly, not fairly, correctly. Mm -hmm. And I think the concern that's arisen here and why I support Janet Woodcock's call for an OIG investigation is there's a real concern about the, the, did the process actually work or has it broken down? Is this a one-off, you know, mistakes were made and they accumulated and almost what's becoming kind of a tragic dark comedy, or does this reflect a new way things are happening at FDA? Uh, there are other drugs in the pipeline that could be, get this kind of approval now. Um, so this is not, this is very concerning in the field. And I think the American public ought to be concerned as well. 
Jason, do you, I really, I'm interested that you frame this really as a kind of informed consent response that you, you know, you've been, you're uh, encouraging families to understand how this process happened and how it may have broken down. I wonder if you would also agree that there's an, an obligation, or at least it would be a good thing for um, referring um, physicians to talk about the impact on the patient and the family, not only of whether the drug works or doesn't work, but that PET, a PET scan will be needed to determine whether they have plaque, that yeah. they will need to be monitored for brain imaging, To that 40% of the people in the, who received this drug during the Biogen trials had brain swelling or brain bleeding. I mean, that's a very high percentage. And that mm -hmm. seems to me the, that the financial impact, the inconvenience impact, and the risk of, of brain um, side effects um, are part of that informed consent package. Of course they are. Um, there, there are some dark ironies to this. You know, one th because this drug is out there, um, it very well may make it easier to do uh, amyloid imaging in order to help someone arrive at a better understanding of the cause of their mild cognitive impairment. Now, I, I say dark irony because um, it's sad that now a diagnostic test could be available for folks because a questionably a beneficial drug of great expense has been put out on availability. And I say this because many in the field, when I chat with them say, well, you know, shouldn't have happened, but I guess it's win-win because now we can, you know, get access to diagnostics and the, and the 4% that's earned from the prescribing of this drug will bring some funds flow into memory centers, which have been basically impoverished since their creation. So maybe, you know, we'll finally get the the necessary support staff to provide patient and family education about the risks, the benefits, the hassles of the drug, you know, et cetera, uh, the monitoring, you know, help for transportation to come in. Yeah. And you listen to all this and, you know, of course you want to build your memory center, right? I mean, my memory center provides patient and family education that's so valuable and part of care just as much as out of home should be part of care because a donor gave us millions of dollars to pay for our social work team. If we had to rely on clinical billing to support our memory center, we would fire that staff within a month because we couldn't cover their salaries. And there is a dark irony that it takes a questionably beneficial drug to bring in the revenue to finally get memory centers up and functioning. And I'm, I haven't directly answered your question, but I think folks need to know, this is part of a larger conversation in America about how a big, vast and problematic disease is being treated which um, essentially what this reveals is that a disease in America isn't really a fully a disease until it has a business model. And much of that business model relies on the pharmaceutical industry. I like to prescribe drugs that work. I personally, and in my own family, have met family members who are alive because of pharmaceuticals. Um, but there's also these dark ironies that this story of aducanumab is unfolding and revealing to us. Let me provide a little more context and you correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Carla Wish or, or, or Dr. Kesselheim, um, but just so people understand, Medicare was not paying for PET scans to detect amyloid That's absolutely right. because That's absolutely right. Right. there was nothing that could be done. So there was no point in doing the diagnostic imaging if we didn't, if, if there was nothing to be done now, yeah, no, no, it, this, it, it, what you're meaning about irony is right. Excuse me. What, yeah, what you're yeah. meaning about irony is that um, by approving this questionable drug through this um, accelerated pathway, now Medicare can no longer say there's nothing to be done and now they will be obliged to provide for these PET scans. That is, that is exactly right. You have linked A to B to C to arrive at D or whatever, however you wanna, that is exactly right. And again, I, my colleagues and I couldn't wait for the day when we did have an effective drug and we could be able to give people a biomarker based diagnosis to really say to them, you are, you do have Alzheimer's or you do not, you know, and this is what your future is. And so let's make plans and get treatment going, you know, but, but this is not the, it is unfolding in a way that just, you know, yes. it, it's very frustrating. So uh, Danny the appeared. story of why amyloid imaging wasn't approved is a fascinating story, again, about the failure to build memory centers to act adequately use that test in a responsible way. Yeah, there's so much to discuss here. And I know the clock is ticking. And that's why Danny has helpfully shown back up to, let, to remind us that we have 600 people uh, uh, aching to ask questions. So Danny, tell us what, you, what you've got. 
People are being so generous in the Q&A function. We've gotten a lot of questions. I think a common theme of a lot of the questions coming in is a lot of people just want the panelists to expand on the internal investigation happening at the FDA right now. And also related questions, that's more of a clarification question on, you know, what exactly does the FDA stand to gain by approving this drug? Okay, thanks. I think um, that's a question for both of you, but maybe we'll start with Aaron. Sure. So, um, so basically what happened is last week, uh, John Woodcock, who is the acting director of the FDA, um, requested that the OIG look into, uh, there was a, a, an excellent uh, report in Stat News that detailed some um, conversations, informal conversations between one of the FDA reviewers and Biogen early in the process. And um, those, you know, are, are those kinds of interactions arguably should be, um, you know, more transparent and clear about them. And so what, what Dr. Woodcock has asked is, a, is whether or not the OIG wants to investigate those interactions. I would suggest that instead, all aspects of this uh, approval process should be investigated yeah. from the, uh, you know, relationship, the, the sort of long-term relationship between the FDA and Biogen early in the process to reanalyze the data and to, you know, come up with explanations as to why the one trial was the positive and correct trial and the other trial was the negative and incorrect trial. Again, you know, it is important for FDA and sponsors to talk with each other, but that level of detailed, um, you know, collaboration is almost unprecedented. So I think it's important to investigate the process there. It's important to investigate the process leading up to the advisory committee, why certain things were chosen to be discussed there, why certain things were not chosen to be discussed, how the FDA switched yeah. gears after the advisory committee, how the FDA arrived at the extremely broad initial labeling that, that approved the drug for all people with all, all, all types of Alzheimer's disease, even people with severe Alzheimer's disease where you would not expect this kind of treatment to be useful. And um, and and why the why the company was given nine years of follow up? I think all of those different steps in the process should be the subject of more complete investigation. Because as I said, you know, I, I like I like to think that the FDA makes the right decision most of the time, and, and the FDA fulfills an extremely important public health function in this country and the world. And uh, and so when there is a decision that is as problematic as this one is, we need to try to better understand how it became, how it was arrived at so that we can, you know, try to prevent similar bad decisions in the future, but also try to, you know, enhance that trust that, that people need to have in the FDA's decision making. Jason, anything you'd add to that in terms of the integrity of the FDA and the process? I, Aaron's summary is spot on. Um, I'm concerned that Janet Woodcock's call is very narrow. You know, the relationships between selected members of FDA and Biogen, look into that, is that okay or not? Great, otherwise, that's not enough. Uh, Aaron's detailed the things that need to be looked into. Fortunately, at least two congressional committees are interested and I do hope those committees meet. Um, you could argue though that that just sort of will now overly politicize this, um, but uh, 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 this needs to be figured out um, yeah. and, as Aaron has detailed. There's, there's a lot to be investigated about this decision and the process that was undertaken, but it also raises the question of the trust, trustworthiness of the FDA in our times, you know, the structural issues. For example, the decision to, um, I don't think uh, many of the people in our audience may not know that FDA receives user fees that are extremely important to their budget from industry, if I'm, if I had, again, correct, you know, Aaron, I know that you're the expert on this and Jason knows a lot more about it than I do, but um, there are structural issues here. If we were really going to take a big lens, um, not only this particular process, but the way Congress and our society has decided to constrain what uh, is, was originally seen, and I hope st is still is seen as the fourth, you know, the foremost regulatory agency with the highest integrity of trying to keep unsafe things off our streets in the world, but now is dependent upon user fees from industry. And also the, we, we've chosen to evaluate them by the number of approvals they make and the speed with which they make those approvals. Um, so I imagine there are, you know, if we really wanted to have a big lens on this, we would be seeing a thorough investigation of this decision, but uh, uh, opening up the whole set of questions about the role of regulation um, and safety and effectiveness in our society. 
and what institutions, how institutions should be structured to most, sa most safeguard those, those goals. Okay, Tammy, I noticed, I by the way, I noticed in the chats, uh, the, the questions, several people asking some, you know, important nuanced questions about the drug and its risks. Um, our, the, the Penn Memory Center has put together a web page with a Q&A summary about the drug that we've been updating. So if you go to pennmemorycenter.org, uh, P-E-N-N, memorycenter.org, you click on the aducanumab page and we've done our best to kind of summarize what's known, what's not known, um, just lay out the facts as best as we can gather them. Unfortunately, there is a lot of misperceptions about the drug since it's been approved in the, you know, statements about the drug in, in the popular press and other and other places saying that the drug is a, you know, is a treatment for Alzheimer's disease. And, and again, the FDA didn't even approve it as that. It approved it on the basis of lowering out, uh, you know, um, lowering amyloid exactly. plaque. And so I think that the, that cl the clarity around that is, is really important. And the FDA and Biogen should be doing a much taking a much more active role in trying to dispel some of those misperceptions. Yeah, I mean, now, the goal of the Alzheimer's field was, you know, what's our cholesterol? What's our hemoglobin A1C, cholesterol, heart disease, hemoglobin A1C, diabetes? Treat that and you know you're treating the patient's disease, okay? Um, and that's a very, I don't contest the, that theory. These data, this trial, this drug was not the set of data to enter into that new biomarker-based world. Can you, can you help our audience understand the set of studies that have been done? Because my understanding is that um, if you look at the set of studies about amyloid plaque, that some yeah. people can have high amounts of plaque and no cognitive impairment and very little plaque and lots of cognitive impairment. Is that, tr is that true? Yeah. So um, the, the, the website I mentioned, someone just popped another question, is penmemorycenter.org penmemorycenter.org. P-E-N-N, -N, as in memorycenter.org, yep. So um, the am there have been multiple drugs studied that target amyloid. Um, one of the two pathologic uh, 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 markers uh, of Alzheimer's disease. And um, uh, many of the drugs have shown an effect on amyloid, meaning by effect on amyloid, they reduce it, they alter the levels, et cetera. Uh, none have shown that it clearly translates into a clear, obvious effect on disease course. But let me now get nuanced in a way that I think is very important. The totality of the drugs is a disappointment. That is absolutely true. But um, in the last several years, and aducanumab is part of the story, we're beginning to see that depending on the kind of drug and how it goes after amyloid without getting into nuance, it's not just cleaning up amyloid like a vacuum cleaner cleans up the dog hair. There's nuances about how to do this, number one. And number two, the kind of patient that receives the drug in terms of where they're at in the pathologies of the disease, we're beginning to see signals that maybe we are able to affect the natural history of the disease. And there are promising drugs and aducanumab still remains in that list but the study designs are still being nuanced. And I don't, I say the word nuance, uh, that's probably not the right word. They're still being worked out. And let me make a point that I think is really important. I'm guilty of a line that I regret I used in my writings. In the last 20 years, there's been no treatment for Alzheimer's disease. And when you start with that premise, you create that sense of, well, we've got to do something, zero progress mm. in 20 years. That, that statement is factually correct but it is superficial because the last several years we've seen real progress with better understanding where someone's at specifically in the pathologic course of the disease and when therefore a drug might be the right drug to target and measure its response. And that's why this decision by FDA is so frustrating because it throws almost sand in the gears of that progress we were making and creates this, it really disrupts that. And that's I think why many of my colleagues feel very frustrated that we were really making good progress, and then this happened. And, and um, well, we'll just move along as best we can, I suppose. So you're concerned about what it will mean for science and be, a, being able to do true progress, but you also are Yeah, well, let me give you one example. So in May of 2020, in the New England Journal of Medicine, e colleagues from Eli Lilly uh, published a report of their drug, Denanumab, for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Phase two study, well-designed, some very interesting aspects of the design 
very vanguard use of both amyloid and tau imaging. My point is this progress, very interesting set of signals. And the conclusion of the abstract of that New England Journal of Medicine paper was further research is necessary to validate and confirm these benefits. And the field was very excited to see that further research done. And then in June, after FDA's decision, Eli Lee said, we're applying for, we're going to probably apply for accelerated approval. And I can't fault a company for doing what companies do. If the regulators are changing the standards for what it takes to get a drug to market, well, we're gonna go. And I can't fault a company for being a company in America. But my point is, is will, we, will they do the study they said they were going to do or not? I mean, we'll find out. And as Aaron points out, we have to figure out what happened with this decision because not just denanomab, but lecanemab, gantinirumab are all in the works and could now be popped out into clinical practice without the studies that are needed to show, is this the drug I should prescribe for my patients? We ha how can we hold the FDA accountable for making sure those follow-up studies get done? And yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, so that that's the, that's a big question, and and again, I think this points back to the rules around accelerated approval and things that need to change around the rules of accelerated approval to try to better ensure that those that those follow up trials are done and done in a timely fashion and done at high you know with high quality. Um, you know, I think that uh, unfortunately, uh, too often with accelerated approval, those those trials aren't done. But but I think there are steps you can take. So. And I, I mentioned some of them earlier, but you can make sure that the trials are already underway or are set up to go before you approve the drug, which means, by the way, that you don't, you know, change gears and just decide to approve the drug on accelerated approval at the 11th hour of a long drug approval process. You, you know, you make sure that there are that the trials are done at a high level of rigor and that, the you know, the endpoints are reasonable endpoints. And then if the trials are um, you know, not done after a certain period of time, then there are consequences to, to not having the trials done after a certain period of time. And if the trials are negative, then the drug gets removed or the indication gets automatically removed from the market. None of those things currently happen. And as a result, you get things like what happened with this, um, there was a muscular dystrophy drug that was approved on accelerated approval back in 2016 on the basis of increasing muscle dystrophin levels in extremely small amount. And the FDA was like, well, they'll, do an accelerated approval, they'll have a confirmatory trial that'll be done. And you know, four years later, the FDA put out an expression of concern that the accelerated approval trial, the confirmatory trial hadn't yet begun. And so, you know, in those circumstances, what, what do you do? And, and I think that, that part of the process of learning from this episode is gonna be um, thinking about the accelerated approval process and how to ensure that it's um, fairly implemented. It almost seems like it could be a hack in the sense that if you can't show efficacy, but you can show something with a biomarker, you, then you can get to approval that way and not really have to ever approve efficacy. It's almost, I mean, is that yeah. too strong a word? Well, I, I'll, I'll, walk, I'll walk back from, from hack, but it, 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 it almost, you know, like it becomes a compromised position and, and, and it shouldn't be the sort of, well, you know, we couldn't really agree on standard approval, so let's just give it accelerated. You know, one of the aspects of accelerated approval um, that uh, is part of the regs and was certainly in the uh, statements that FDA issued was this is a bad disease. There's no treatments. Patients are desperate. And you put that together and that gives you the sort of uh, social cultural warrant to use these accelerated approval re re regulations, which were which were written in the in the beginning of the AIDS era when we needed to get drugs wow. into bodies. Um, and I, I get that sentiment. I think it's part of the equation. Let's not deny it. But I think another word needs to be talked about here in addition to trust and the desire, in addition to desperation, the desire for hope. And that's the word trust. And again, I go back to, you know, if I was at FDA, if I was Janet Woodcock, I would say, does the American people trust the FDA? And if there's an, even a doubt about the answer to that question, then she needs to repair that trust because trust is like porcelain, you know, it's easily cracked, but once it's cracked, it's hard to repair. Danny, what else are you seeing? We're getting a lot of questions about precedent, like whether or not this was an anomaly. So specifically people have asked, is it normal for um, the FDA to totally ignore advisory committees? And is this one incident in a continuation of several approvals from weak 
evidence. Um, so I would say some of the statistics indicate that the FDA um, agrees with the advisory committee about three quarters of the time. However, when the FDA disagrees with the advisory committee, it's usually disagreeing in a more conservative way, such that the advisory committee recommends approval and the FDA says, well, we'll approve it, but we'll also want to make sure that these, you know, there's a special um, safety restriction on the drug for reason X or X, Y, or Z or something like that. Also, it is also relatively unusual that the FDA disagrees with an advisory committee that was nearly as unanimous as, as that was as unanimous as our, as our committee was. So I think that both of those things um, make this a bit of an outlier and whether or not it is, you know, precedent or, you know, um, setting for some kind of example for how things are gonna go in the future, um, we'll see. I think it does set precedents First of all, as, as uh, Jason pointed out, it sets precedence for how the FDA is going to treat other uh, Alzheimer's drugs. And as you know, as you pointed out, there is now no basis for the FDA to deny approval for these other drugs in the pipeline that also change amyloid le levels without understanding how they how they actually work on clinical practice. And I think it sets precedent for other diseases as well to, to try to you know uh, make the claim that, well, we also have um, you know, sort of uh, biomarkers that we've been studying that we don't have agreement around. And we have drugs that may affect those biomarkers without knowing if they actually affect the disease. Why can't our drug get the same um, treatment as the, as the Alzheimer's drugs got? So I think that it sets precedent in that sense as well. Aaron, I'm curious how often in your experience or what, uh, either at, in your role in the committee or just in your scholarship around FDA, have they asked an advisory committee, body of evidence, safe st standard approval, okay, thank you, advisory committee, but then going off and use different regs to d make a decision. Is that something that happens or is that, was that unusual? Yeah, I've, I've, never, I've never heard of that before. Um, so this was triply unusual. It was unusual because they went against their advisory board rec. That's 20% of the time they have done that and they can do that. And, but typically they go against the advisory board when the advisory board says approve it, but they say, no, we don't. But then they also went and did, well, we gave you one set of regs and questions, but we actually are going to now think about it on a different set of regs and different set of evidence. So it's triply unusual. And I guess the point I, but what irks me about this is you're at FDA on the evening of June 7th, uh, you know, the, the, the evening, uh, June 6th. And you say, we're about ready to announce a drug that the advisory board wasn't asked to rule on it, weigh in on it. We're divided within our agency about what we should do. They were divided. They had three different views in the agency. This is a first in its kind drug. There's not clear consensus in the field that this is the biomarker with which to treat. I, I would have said, you know, maybe we should put the brakes on this and go back and at least have an advisory board hearing and to see how this plays out there. But that didn't happen. And here we are. One last question from the audience, Danny. Hi, so we had a quick question just about how would you respond to patients who say that they actually want this drug available to them now? Um, maybe this is more of a question directed towards Dr. Karlowish. What would you say to your patients that well, again, on a case, I cannot, I am not going to let my patients, you know, be the, 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 the crucible upon which this fight is fought. Okay. They have to live with this disease. All disease is bad. This disease is uniquely bad. If someone has mild cognitive impairment, meaning inefficiencies in cognition caused by Alzheimer's or mild stage dementia caused by Alzheimer's disease, and they learn, they listen to everything that we've talked about today read the materials we and others have created. If after all that, they say, I'm taking the drug, you know, I cannot fault them for making that decision. In matters of taste, there's no disputing. But, I would, so I would, I'm gonna, I guess I would push back a little bit on that. And I, I would, so I take care of patients in, my, in a primary care clinic as well. I would not recommend this drug and I wouldn't ad administer it because I don't think that the drug has sufficient evidence that it works. And I think it has all kinds yeah. of risks, both bodily and financial. And so if a patient comes into my office and says, you know, Dr. Kesselheim, you know, I want this drug no matter what you say, and I know that it's available on the market. So prescribe it for me. I would probably tell them to try to find another provider to do that because th there's not because I don't I don't feel like I could I could yeah. 
I hear you, Aaron. I hear you. I hear you. I do. I guess I'm there to be the gutter provider, you know, and uh, maybe it's because I work at a memory center and the typical new patient story is a family that spent about a year trying to get a straight answer for why my mom has a memory problem, you know, and um, I guess, you know, I admit it's an unusual place I work at in that sense. Um, but if they've made it in there and whatnot, I don't know. It's, Jason, uh, I don't know, not to, Jason, not to jump on you as, uh, on top of Aaron, but um, I think you're emphasizing the end game of your conversation with parents, uh, with patients and their families, what you would ultimately do based on your respect for yeah. their autonomy and their journey. But I, I would, I think our audience, we have a whole bunch of questions about this, wants to hear what the, what your views are about uh, why it may not be the right thing for them to do. So you've- well, I, I, I think the right thing to do would be to find a clinical trial of a drug and be enrolled in a clinical trial where you're doing, at least, you're doing two things. You're getting well monitored you're getting good data about whether it's affecting you benefit as well as harm. And you're contributing to the thing that, and this is what's so sad. The folks who were in all these clinical trials, they say to me, I can't believe this happened. I was in these trials. I tried to make this drug a possibility and this is what happened. And they actually kind of feel angry. I really gave my blood, sweat and time for this study. And now this is what it's all come to. And it's interesting. They, well, I'm going to take it because I've been in the trials. I know what it's like. I've tolerated the drug, but I did all this work. And this is what you've given me. Yeah. Is their answer back to the system? And, you know, anyway. Okay. We only have two minutes left. I want to thank both of you so much for doing this and especially doing it. Um, Dr. Carla wish on your vacation and both of you on short notice. I want to thank the people who've joined us and these great questions. Um, I, I want to say the Hastings center has a blog where there's a very compelling essay about why I wouldn't want my mother to take this drug. I'm going to see that um, we put that on our homepage. If you want to read some more about this, um, and just to summarize, we've talked about ethical problems, I think at three levels. We've talked about the social impacts of this approval. Has it, is it eroding um, our trust in the, F, in the FDA? We didn't get a chance to talk about some other social impacts like costs to the taxpayer of the increased burdens that are gonna fall on Medicare. So there's a lot of social impacts we could continue discussing. Um, the other social impact is perhaps an erosion in our ability to do the science as well. Then a second level I've heard through this um, hour is clinical impacts for the patient. There were a lot of questions. I don't think we got a chance to answer completely that this is risky drug. 40% did have brain swelling and brain bleeding. And so they have to have brain images. They have to be able to go into a high tech place to get that, those images. Um, and then family impacts, especially in terms of false expectations and also in terms of costs, because it won't only be Medicare that's paying for this. Um, there'll be co-pays and there'll be costs for those uh, imaging studies. So I think we've really, you know, it's a complex, been a very complex story. Um, <clears throat> I hope that the hour has helped us all make better decisions uh, for ourselves and our loved ones as the time approaches to confront cognitive impairment that unfortunately many of us are going to face in our lifetimes. Longe longevity is great, <laughs> but, but it com comes with a cost. And often that's um, some period of time with frailty and dementia. For decades, the Hastings Center has been focusing on improving end of life care and enhancing quality of life for the growing number of elderly um, in many aging societies around the world. And I, I hope today's program adds to our mutual understanding of those challenges. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks so Thank much you. guys for organizing this. Bye Aaron, good to see you man. <laughs> Take care Dr. Jason. Yeah. Thank you all for joining us today. We encourage you to please, please, please continue this discussion online using the hashtag Breakthrough Breakdown. A video of this recording will be available shortly on www.thehastingcenter.org. Thanks so much again and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Danny.